So it's James Arguin. I've been with the ICTR since November 2010 through November 30th, 2015. And I've held the position as Chief of the Appeals and Legal Advisory Division in the Office of the Prosecutor. Could you describe what you, what you walked into? What, what was the ICTR? What kind of shape was it in, in uh, 2010? Well, in 2010, um, most of the trials had been completed. There were a few cases remaining, about five or six cases remaining, that were still an active trial, and trials were completed uh, in end of 2012, the last trial. Uh, but at the time, the office, and the office of the prosecutor, and the whole tribunal, chambers and uh, registry, were gearing up for all of the appellate work to come. Uh, there were several pending cases where we were waiting trial judgments and all the other cases were in the pipeline to come. So it was a time of transition where the bulk and the focus of the tribunal's efforts were shifting from the appeal, uh, from the trial stage to the appellate stage. And um, so it was a, an interesting time to arrive, particularly in my position. Mm -hmm. What were the challenges right off the bat when you, when you walked in the door? Well, there, there was a huge volume of work um, in terms of, as you you know, the judgments, of course, are enormous. The cases went through trial for a year or more in most cases, and the judgments were thousands of pages long. The records associated with those cases were absolutely enormous, much more than any typical domestic practice. Uh, to staff the cases and to get uh, familiarity with the record required a great deal of resources, human resources particularly, of people who were trained and had expertise in handling appeals and could identify the weaknesses in the case and the likely avenues or issues that would come up on appeal and how to respond to them. That took a lot of effort and one of the first things we needed to do was to build up our appeals teams so we had not only the staffing but the expertise we needed to deal with those complicated records and complicated legal issues on appeal. And we were just speaking with Judge Pele about when she first arrived here how there was no infrastructure whatsoever and there was really the sense that everything that was being done was being done for the first time. When, when you arrived did you feel like there was a structure in place for everything? Or with the appeals, were you having to kind of reinvent the wheel all over again? Well, I think there were the, the basic infrastructure of the tribunal, I mean, the administrative framework was in place. Uh, the systems were in place in terms of rules of evidence and practice directions. Uh, the chambers had adopted, you know, their, their judgment drafting policies, and they were policies and procedures, obviously, within the office of the prosecutor. I think, though, most policies and practices were focused on the trial stage, and not a lot of experience had been developed dealing with the appellate stage. And I suppose the rules were there, the procedures were there. Um, I think, though, that uh, not all the expertise had been developed. Um, what needed the biggest challenge was turning things around to be much more proactive in how we dealt with appeals to make sure that we weren't simply waiting for the defendant's briefs or waiting even for the trial judgment, but actively framing issues on appeal uh, at the trial stage while we still had a chance to uh, uh, tackle the issues and frame them in the way that was um, helpful to the prosecution, um, but also uh, in a way that uh, prepared the case so that we could deal with the case within the tight time frames that the rules required. Uh, you know, 30 days to file a notice of appeal, 30 days to file the brief. So very tight time frames for huge cases and, and very large records. And all of that required a lot of advanced preparation, uh, work that I don't think had been done um, or thought of uh, when I, until when I arrived and we started instituting new practices and procedures within OTP, for instance, for appeal readiness reports, and other mechanisms to make sure that as much, as much advance work was done before the case actually hit the appeal stage so that we could then focus on the issues and focus on crafting our arguments and presenting uh, the best case possible. How much precedence was there for something like 
the ICTR, I mean, on the Legacy Committee, we were always arguing over, like, what exact claims could be made, but still, like, when you step back, it looks like a lot of the things that were done were being done well, for the first time. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, the Nuremberg Tribunal was the only real precedent, and then the other, it, was until, it wasn't until the ICTY and ICTR came that you started developing uh, the more modern definitions of international crimes and crimes against humanity. Uh, and also, more importantly, too, you can't forget the, all the practice directions, all the rules of procedure and evidence, all came with, this, with the ICTR and ICTY. And it's not enough to just have the rules written down in a book. They often have to be interpreted and expanded upon in the jurisprudence. So all of that jurisprudence had been developed not only through the trial stage, but also was also being developed in the appellate stage, too, because there had been appeals and there had been both from final judgments and interlocutory appeals all of which help frame and add more uh, substance to the meaning of the rules and the practice directions, as well as the jurisprudence itself. So there was a good deal to work with. Um, and I think also it was because we shared a common appeals chamber, uh, the precedents set by the ICTY appeals chamber were also um, a very highly persuasive use and very informative in terms of our work as well. And, and as at the time we were doing our appeals, we also would look at all the other ad hoc tribunals uh, or hybrid courts um, that had been set up because their jurisprudence also, because they were encountering similar issues and sometimes had similar rules. And all of that would be persuasive authority that we would have to thoroughly canvas. Uh, so we spent a lot of time looking at all of that jurisprudence. What, uh, what motivated you to come here to begin with? Well, I think it's a, it's a, it was a tremendous opportunity, um, but also with that comes the responsibility of working on uh, some of the most serious cases in the world. Um, I think it's uh, been a very humbling experience to come from uh, a national practice uh, where I've done a lot of appellate work in uh, both criminal and civil, uh, but to come here is a whole different tier at the international level. And the, the level of, of criminality that we're dealing with and the impact of uh, the, the crimes on, on just huge numbers of people, uh, a nation as a whole, uh, is just staggering. And it's, uh, it's humbling because as much as you do your best and try to contribute to um, the you know, respect for the rule of law, the interests of justice, and I suppose reconciliation, all of which are are important values in, in any kind of prosecution. The the you feel that the impact you have is you know there's just so much more you could do or everyone should do. Um, even now as we're closing, I mean it's, it's sobering to reflect on the fact that we've only touched the tip of the iceberg. There are thousands of more fugitives remaining, not only from the ISTR but from national courts as well. And the work still remains to be done. And the baton has to pass mostly to the national courts to do that, which is a, which is a huge challenge. And, the, and I, I'm proud that, in a sense, we've contributed to setting the stage for more national prosecutions uh, of these crimes. But also, it's just humbling to think that there's so much left to be done, it's particularly when you look around the world and you see other conflicts uh, where other situations that seem ripe for genocide or other crimes against humanity are also still ongoing. So I think it's important as we close to reflect on not only the, what we've accomplished, but also what remains to be accomplished. And I, I, I think that's a major uh, area where the entire international community has to reflect seriously on how strong a commitment we have to upholding the rule of law and, and promoting accountability for people who violate uh, human rights throughout the world. Not just take a victory lap? No, by no means. I don't think this, I think it's a time for reflection. I think if anything, what can't be lost in the history of the tribunal are the fact that you had so many victims. And, you know, and I think there have to be lessons learned on this. And, it, and to me, it's very sobering to talk to a victim and it's particularly disheartening when a victim is not satisfied with the judgment or just doesn't think you've done enough. That has to be a call to arms or a call to reflection to think, what could we have done more? How could we have done it differently? 
and outreach and all those things are critically important. But as you know from your time with the tribunal, projects like this don't happen without external funding. And we, we needed to do a better job maybe of sharing the message of the work that was done, how the cases were prosecuted, how the persons were selected for prosecution, that the idea was never to prosecute everyone responsible, that there simply could not be an international court that could do that, that had the, the, the mandate to do that or the resources to do that. But what we could do is to go after the top people, those who are most responsible, uh, make sure that they were brought to account, whether they were found guilty or acquitted, but they were brought to account in a trial. Uh, and I think we needed to do more, particularly since we were based here in Tanzania, to make sure that the community in Rwanda was aware of what was going on and more fully apprised of what was going on. Uh, and there, I think, is a major, a very important lesson for future tribunals to make sure that you know justice has to be seen. It doesn't just have to happen. And if, as much as possible, we should try to make sure that there are courts in the country that's affected so the victims and, and the witnesses and the public at large see justice being delivered in their own communities. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, in conflict zones and other places, that needs a lot of capacity building and a lot of uh, development work and partnerships with the international community and other actors to make sure international fair trial standards are met. But that is a commitment that we have to have. And it has to be a commitment that actually is not just words, but action and funding and other ways to make it happen. And uh, there's a lot to learn from, I think, what uh, our experience in, in Rwanda and the referral of cases and other, and other areas where I think Rwanda has, has shown, has come from a country that was devastated by the genocide to a country that is now uh, handling its own cases and... Uh, has functioning judiciary and uh, is is bringing is bringing justice to many victims. Other things that now that you have a chance to reflect, looking back, that you wish uh, would have been done differently. Now that we have the benefit of, of hindsight, anything that really stands out that, that that you wish we we knew at the time. I think often as lawyers and um, you know you you kind of think people understand the process. And the reality is very few people are familiar with the criminal process, let alone a criminal process in an international tribunal in a foreign country. And I think we needed to probably, not, we as a tribunal, needed to do more to make sure that we spent more time uh, explaining our work and explaining the nuances of our cases uh, to the population we were serving. And, you know, it, one, it, one way of doing that is through the outreach centers, the learning centers. But there you're giving them resources, raw materials. There needed to be more, and we did it only occasionally. We're, you know, we're doing it, uh, planning on doing it uh, with our last judgment in Butare, where we actually go and talk to the prosecution witnesses for our office and explain the outcome of the case, explain the reasoning of the court, explain why there were certain rulings this way or that way just so that people understand the nuances or the technicalities that are sometimes involved in rules of evidence um, and burdens of proof uh, and other issues in, in legal rulings in terms of what the elements of a case are, what the elements of proof are and the standards of evidence. That, If that's done, it may help people understand why certain judgments go certain ways. Um, and I think also it's good to, to talk with witnesses and victims realistically about what the strength of the case is and what they should expect in the process. That, you know, the case doesn't end with the trial. There are appeals. And appeals also uh, can result in reversals of convictions. And even beyond appeals, there are applications for review of judgments based on new evidence. And all of that, I think, is something that, um, that witnesses and victims need to understand. And they need to understand also that it's part of the system of justice uh, and that uh, there, there are various reasons and procedures in place to protect not only the interests of the accused, but the interests of justice as a whole. Uh, and I don't know if that message has been adequately conveyed, but that's something that I think we, we could have had a more vibrant outreach program to try to do that, to maintain much more contact with the witnesses and the victims.
and the public at large in Rwanda. One, one of the broader questions we've been asking people is, has justice been brought to Rwanda? What is, what is the state of justice in Rwanda as you see it? Well, I think, like I said before, I think, you know, justice is in the works and justice doesn't happen overnight. Um, I think what you see in the Kachacha process is, uh, you know, the ISDR is one piece of the puzzle. The Kachacha was a major piece of the puzzle in terms of the ordinary Rwandan citizen being able to see justice being delivered in community courts um, in, in um, you know, with relatively low level cues, but all, all others, everyone, the, the justice was being served because people would be talking about crimes and there was a meaningful opportunity for reconciliation. But there's also the the regular traditional, the Rwandan courts, the high courts and the uh, intermediate courts that also prosecuted people in traditional, in real courts of law, not tribal courts or traditional courts. Um, and then the ICTR. And you also see it in many national jurisdictions that have asserted jurisdiction over Rwandan fugitives uh, and brought them to trial in foreign courts. But I think the reality is there's still thousands of fugitives remaining. So I don't think the work is done by any stretch. Um, there's a real need for uh, mutual legal assistance and cooperation to make sure the fugitives, both from the tribunal, but also from Rwanda national courts, are apprehended and brought to justice. And if they can't be tried in Rwanda, then they need to be tried in some other court that has jurisdiction over those crimes. Um, what can't be done is to just allow the fugitives to escape with impunity. And I think that is a major challenge remaining. And I'm not sure it's been fully addressed in any of the resolutions. Um, the, the residual mechanism is focused on the only three remaining fugitives. The other the six cases, of six fugitive cases, have been referred to Rwanda. But beyond those six fugitive cases, there are thousands of more cases. And I don't think until everyone cooperates and is committed to efforts to apprehend those fugitives and bring them to trial, either in Rwanda or another jurisdiction, that there really will truly be meaningful justice for all victims. What we have now is, you know, we've contributed to justice by going after the most senior leaders, but there are large gaps remaining. It's interesting that we're catching you um, what might be your final night here. Um, and anyone who's been paying attention knows how many hours you've been putting in and investing into the institution. Like, as you're, as you're walking out tonight, how are you going to be feeling about this experience? <laughs> Uh, I feel um, I'm proud of, of whatever contributions I could have made, but I don't feel like I or anyone has done as much as we could or should have done. Uh, the task before us is enormous. Um, we we did, and we can take credit. We can take uh, some pride in holding to account some of those who are most responsible, and I think that fulfills the mandate. Uh, in, in the priority of the mandate, particularly with the completion strategy in mind. But you always wonder if we had investigated more, could we have found more evidence? If we had argued something differently, could we have upheld more convictions? Um, if we had uh, new leads or new tracking, could we find the remaining fugitives or assist the Rwandans in finding those fugitives? You know, I think it, to me it's an unfulfilled agenda. Everything has to close. We know the completion strategy was done. We know our work was limited. But I just hope the closing of the tribunal doesn't mean the end of the delivery of justice. Because it's, uh, it would be a very sad day, I think, to, for both victims and the community at large to know that people who perpetrated some of these crimes are still free and uh, will never be held to account. The community, the international community must stand forward and make sure that they are brought to account. Um, and that is uh, a major challenge remaining. And you don't hear much talk about that. It seems to be left to Rwanda to deal with, but Rwanda can't do it alone because the, these fugitives are not in Rwanda. <laughs> so it's, it's much more complicated than that. And there needs to be a true international commitment to assist in finding and tracking and locating these fugitives and bringing them to justice. How do you feel the ICTR is going to be viewed by future 
professors 20 years from now are, are teaching International Criminal Courts 101 and Rwanda ICTR comes up. Or how, do, how, do you, how do you situate what happened here? Well, I think in, in terms of academia, the, you know, the jurisprudence is well established now. Um, and as are the practice directions and the rules. So I think there's a wealth of jurisprudence now available that can be analyzed and studied. I think there are, um, you know, the basic standards in terms of what are the elements of the offenses have now been articulated and they've been elaborated upon. Modes of liability have been identified and further defined, and there are examples you can draw from the cases that will be very instructive in terms of how they will be applied in future cases. And I think all, uh, the rules of procedure and, and practice have uh, resolved many issues in terms of the admissibility of evidence and, and the practice directions in terms of uh, procedural issues relating to the filing of briefs and arguments and motions. Um, so there's a wealth of information to study. And as, as you know, there's a host of firsts that the tribunal has accomplished in, in international justice. And none of that um, uh, uh, should be minimized because those are major contributions to international law. But I do think one thing, you know, at least one thing that I think should be recognized, particularly as you still hear talk of whether the genocide happened, whether there was one genocide or two genocide, is the, you know, the adjudicated fact uh, and the evidence that was presented here that was accepted as judicially noticed fact beyond dispute that there was a genocide perpetrated against the Tutsi population in Rwanda and, and that approximately 800,000 to a million Tutsis were killed is something that I think at least most victims will take some solace for, from because the crimes that were perpetrated against them, even if their individual perpetrators were not, are still fugitives or have not been prosecuted yet, um, they can take some solace from the fact that, in fact, the crimes against humanity and the genocide that was perpetrated against them has been internationally recognized and established by the tribunal beyond dispute. And that, I think, is a major accomplishment. Uh, and it had practical value, too, in terms of how our cases proceeded thereafter. But that was a major fact and a major finding um, at, that will always be, I think, a, the true legacy of the tribunal. Are there any defining cases or moments that really stand out when you reflect back on your time here? Well, in my time, um, I, think, I think the referral of cases to Rwanda was probably a defining moment. Um, the, we, the prosecution had tried for several years to refer cases to Rwanda, and those applications had been denied because the Rwandan uh, justice sector was not, uh, at the time, believed to be able to sustain the fair trial rights of the accused. I think that was one of the first things that hit my desk when I arrived in 2010. Um, and uh, I worked on that very closely with the Rwandan government and our team here. And I think in the course of developing a record to show how fair trial rights existed in Rwanda, um, we were able to develop a very persuasive record from our discussions and meetings with Rwandan officials where we really actually learned to just listen um, and take a different approach and listen to them in terms of understanding more about how the Rwandan system worked and how their practice uh, developed and how they dealt with certain situations and then hone down to get practical examples from their own cases that we could use to show how, in fact, all the fair trial rights were respected and the laws were not just written on the books, as some said, but actually used in practice. And we were able to point to very specific instances um, where that was done and independent studies confirming that analysis. And I think once that, uh, with that analysis, we were able to open up the door to referrals of cases to Rwanda which was a major turning point in the completion strategy because it enabled us to close, uh, as we are now, in uh, on well, somewhat on schedule, uh, by December 2015. But without the referral of cases, we would have had to finish those trials uh, and completed those cases, and that would have extended our mandate, no doubt, beyond. And I also think it was important for also Rwanda because it showed truly a turning point in the country 
that um, a country that was decimated post-genocide, where there are virtually no lawyers and no judiciary and no, uh, really no functioning justice sector, was now in a position uh, almost 20 years later where an international tribunal would it be, was able to review the laws and the procedures and the functioning system and say, yes, this system is adequate to protect the interests of the accused. That was a major turning point. Uh, I think in the tribunal and in Rwanda, and I think in the international community, which is now extradited in many cases to Rwanda. So um, that, I think, would be one milestone I'd point out. Do, do, do you feel like you learned anything here? Um, I absolutely learned a lot of things um, here. Uh, being a, my first posting in the UN, uh, when I came here, I think I learned about a lot about the UN and the the way uh, an organization like the UN functions. Um, and I, I learned that you can't allow the bureaucracy to swallow you. There's always a way of getting a job done and to press for change and to get things moving, even though there seems to be um, an inertia that maybe surrounds the, bureauc the bureaucracy. But the bureaucracy can be, can work. And I think the tribunal shows, you know, when we started out, no one, no one knew what an international tribunal was or an ad hoc tribunal. So the, the usual practices of the UN had to be adapted to meet the needs of the tribunal. And you saw that at every level of the administration of the tribunal but also in our just in the general administrative rules on how we handle budgeting and leaves and recruitment and all that stuff. Um, that was a very interesting and learning experience. And also, I think, in the case law and just in the cases and handling these massive cases, um, there was a lot of uh, learning exposure for someone like me who's just a national practitioner for working with truly international teams on cases and making the most of people's uh, strengths and weaknesses uh, in terms of staffing a case in a diverse manner and, and also getting the best out of people, finding what their strongest contributions could be and shifting staffing around. Um, that also was, I think, a, a big learning experience. And also just, um, you know, how to reduce... Uh, these very complicated legal cases, factual and legal, with multiple crime scenes, hundreds of witnesses, and thousands of pages, to something that is comprehensible and persuasive, both in our written advocacy, but also in our oral presentations. And I, I think um, in the course of time here, I think, at least for the prosecution, I was very proud that our arguments and our briefs became more and more honed, more and more polished, and much more targeted on the key issues. And we did that through, I think, collaboration in, uh, I've mentioned those appeal readiness reports, but also multiple rounds of brief review in moot courts where everyone's opinions affected the final version of the argument. And that kind of collaborative experience is something that I think is a great learning tool to take away to other work.